Our reading this morning is taken from the letter of James. My brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in filthy old clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand here, you stand there, or sit on the floor by my feet, have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers and sisters, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are blaspheming the noble name of him to whom you belong? If, you really, if you're really keeping the royal law found in scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said, you shall not commit adultery, also said, you shall not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom, because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Take my lips, O Lord, and speak through them. Take our minds and think with them. Take our hearts and set them on fire. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. Keep getting more and more. I look around and somebody else shows up. This is wonderful. <laughs> I, I was a rector of a church for two and a, a year, and, well, two years, and um, Grace Church in West Palm Beach. Some of you have been there before. And they run on Bahamian time. And I'll never forget the first week I got there, they started singing songs about five minutes to ten. And there were five or six of us sitting there. And we started the service at ten, and there were ten or twelve people there. By 10, 15, the place was full. Okay? I figured, well, and they just said, this is the way it is. Okay? Fast forward two years, right? Start the service at five and at ten, there's maybe a dozen people there. By 10.30, the place is packed. You know, it's just, you've you got to get used to that. I just get the biggest kick out of that. A while ago, an experiment took place where they sent an attractive young lady into a pharmacy, and they filmed what kind of response and service that she would get. She went to the counter, asked for a particular product, and the person behind the counter smiled and said, certainly, ma'am, no problem whatsoever. So he took her down the aisle, found the product for her, and answered her questions. When she asked for another product, the staff member took her straight to, to it. Nothing was too much trouble for her. Next, they went to work on this young woman, and, and through the use of good makeup, they made her look like an old woman. She hobbled into the same store, went to the same counter, and asked the same clerk for the same product. Guess what? The attendant pointed over there and says, just over on that counter, and he kept on working. Through her persistence, she finally got the staff member to accompany her and show her where the product was. And when she asked for another product, the attendant rolled his eyes, sighed, and with bad grace, took her to where it was. It was very interesting to see the difference in service that an attractive, attractive young woman would get, as opposed to the kind of service a withered old woman would get. We we'll continue our faith study this morning in the book of James, and the topic today is impartial faith. As we look at chapter 2, verses 1 to 13, which I just read to you, James continues with his manual for practical Christianity and forces us to tackle the tough tasks of favoritism and prejudice in the body of Christ. Many of the issues James, with, James deals with asks us to look at ourselves in the mirror and see what image we project. Many things that we see in the mirror make us uncomfortable. However, we must remember that the epistle of James is an instruction manual for right living. While James acknowledges that Christ has the gift of eternal life through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, he does not want the church to forget external life. 
the way around other people see us operating. A congregation should be taught sound doctrine, but instructed in sacred duty as well. As we look at verses 1 through 4, James is teaching us to show respect and kindness to all, all people. This is the real possibility of thinking that the church needs to tackle. I know the attitude and value of the church should be 180 degrees different from the views of the world. The call is that we are to love and respect one another because of who we are in Christ, not because of our looks, our clothes, or our bank accounts. Some years ago, the former Archbishop of Canterbury, William Temple, told a marvelous story about two young vandals in London who wanted to bring confusion to a very famous store. The vandals broke in during the night, but they didn't steal anything. Instead, they simply rearranged the price tags on all the items, putting a $50 price tag on a $5,000 item and a $1,000 price tag on a $50 item. Then they watched with glee the next morning with sinister delight as the shoppers became even more and more confused along with the sales clerks. The God of the universe created the world exactly as God wanted it to be, putting the highest values on items like faith, honor, character, compassion, commitment, sacrifice, servanthood, and eternal life. During the night, the thief came in and switched the price tags. God said the things that are worthy in life are the things that our society so often neglects or ridicules. God declares the things that have little value are the things that which society places the highest value. The evil one has come in and switched the price tags. <clears throat> the letter of James declares that giving, servanthood, sacrifice to other people, and selfless love are the highest values. Not race, nor class, nor greed, no social status. We know this temptation to switch the price tags come from the tempter, but we can say no. In verses 1 to 4, James gives us the down-to-earth illustration, and his point is well taken. We must leave all favoritism and status-seeking outside in the parking lot when we come to church. The reason is simple. The ground is level at the foot of the cross for everyone. Jesus' ministry touches everyone, the blind beggar, the woman at the well, Nicodemus, Zacchaeus, the rich young ruler, the thief on the cross. His ministry was to everyone, and so too must ours be also. Remember James, that half-brother of Jesus, saw how Jesus extended his ministry beyond the Jewish population to the entire world. He knew that we were baptized into Christ Jesus. Everyone is a member of the, this holy nation, this royal priesthood. We are all saved by grace, not by race. When we practice racism, everyone is wounded and loses their value. <clears throat> you do not need a PhD in psychology to know that people of certain classes and racial heritage have had a difficult time in our society. But these difficulties must not be replicated in the body of Christ. Remember, Jesus, is, Jesus was God's answer to people's belief that God practiced favoritism with Jews and other disliked peoples. In the verses 5 to 9 this morning, James restated the Old Testament truth. Don't judge by outward appearances. God looks inward before he looks outward. We all know that labels can be very deceptive. We don't say, so we say often, don't make value judgments. <clears throat> Dr. Howard Beck, a speech and communications professor at Drew, at Drew University, once gave his class an assignment to write as quickly as they could all the images and words associated that they could think of with the word waitress. The class came up with these lists of words, always looking for a tip, runs in their stockings, forgetful, tough, rough, airhead. These were all kinds of less than flattering words that they gave to the professor. Then he told them, my mother was a waitress, and she worked to help me get through college. She was the most godly woman I have ever known. That is something we might remember the next time we encounter a waitress. We know our society is hooked on outward appearances. Ask any teenager how their looks and dress affect how people respond to them. If they do not look like a model or achieve the status of a sports hero, they are made to feel like inferior people. We label and stereotype people in the stadium and unfortunately in the sanctuary at well. 
we try to switch the price tags. Miami Dolphins coach Don Shula took his wife on a vacation to a small town, a seaside, seaside town in Maine. He had heard it was a quiet place where he could relax without anyone paying attention to them. It seemed wherever he went, people would say, oh, there's a great coach. Hi, Don. It was raining when they arrived and decided to take in a movie. When they entered the small theater, the lights were on and the show had not started. To their surprise, a scattered handful of people gave them a round of applause as they seated themselves. Secretly pleased, Shula whispered to his mice, wife, I guess there isn't anywhere I'm not known. Yeah, Nona loved the world over, she replied, with just the touch of sarcasm. When a man with a friendly smile came over and shook his hand with Shula, he said, I'm really surprised you know me here, Shula remarked. Should I know you? The man replied. We're just happy to see you, folks. The manager said he wouldn't start the film until at least two more people showed up. <laughs> You've had that experience, I can tell. <laughs> Remember, in the Christian faith, we all lean on the grace of God. We are all beggars telling other beggars where we have found the bread of life. We are all beggars telling other beggars where we have found the bread of life. The word of God tells us how mortals took upon the outward appearance, but the Lord looks upon the heart. We, are, we who are Christ's people must learn to see people as Christ sees them. Christ died for all of us and lives in each and every one of us and Christ does not play favorites. The cross is the fame, fortune, and favored status that we will ever need. Recently, Robert Leach, TV host of the Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous, said, after interviewing hundreds of rich and famous people, it is clear to me that money and fame do not automatically make people happy. It, has come, it has to come from within. I'd rather have a million smiles in my heart than a million dollars in my pocket. James agrees with him. In verses 10 through 13, we are told that God's love must be equally shared by all of us. It is said when people would leave after healing Philip Brooks. How many know who Philip Brooks is? Anybody know? Philip Brooks was a bishop of Massachusetts, and he was a famous preacher, and he preached at, um, at the church in, uh, in Boston, and people would come from miles around to listen to him, and he was, he was really famous. It was like 1899. The only reason I know is because his birthday is the same day as mine. So, just a little side note. <laughs> What's that? 1899, that's right, exactly, yes. <laughs> eh, eh? Make, makeup's pretty good, isn't it, huh? <laughs> People would listen to him and they would comment about, not about Reverend Brooks, but about Reverend Brooks' savior. What they were doing was they were seeing through Reverend Brooks and they were seeing the God that Reverend Brooks was telling them about. Now, that's what our job is to do that people need to see through you to see who Jesus is in your life. And that makes all the difference in the world. Okay? The Christ in me sees the Christ in you. Someone once said that the first time he met Mother Teresa, he knew that he had met a person whom Jesus Christ was more important than herself. Joy in life comes as Christ increases in you and I decrease. We need to get rid of our egos. And does anybody know what those ego stands for? Edging God out. Edging God out, easing God out, edging God out. That's right, okay. What does that mean? It means that the more important I feel, the less important God is in my life. So I've got to get rid of my what? Ego in order to let God come into my life. We can't let anyone switch the price tags. God's law weighs any law made by humans. It guides our treatment for, of everyone. God's law allows us and empowers us to tackle the tough tasks of our faith in our life. <coughs> there are many stories told about a Southern leader who was General Robert E. Lee. One of the most moving examples takes place in the church, not on the battlefield. One morning at a prestigious church in Virginia, a black gentleman came to worship. It was Communion Sunday and the church was used used a common cup. The invitation was given and the black man, along with others, started to the front. Panic came over. Many members raised the tradition of segregation and slavery. They were very uncomfortable. Suddenly, one of the laymen came forward and stood beside the black man, and the service went forward without any further interruption. That man was Robert E. Lee. 
He provided great direction for the cause of brotherhood that day, and many followed his witness, and so may we do also. You see, most of us never complain about injustice in life when it falls in, falls in our favor. However, James does not want us to dismiss the reality of favoritism and racism as it occurs in life and in the church. He wants us to see the church clearly as it is, a place of potential prejudice, and then he wants us to envision what it could be, a place where the new world order is practice. He will lift our hands to the higher and holier hands of God. Here we are not united by classes, creeds, races, or social standing, but by the shed blood of Jesus Christ as he died for us on the cross. The Lord's Supper celebrates Jesus Christ, broken and crucified, and celebrates our common experience in receiving him as our Lord and our Savior. The Lord's Supper reminds us today that despite the fact that we gather in many different, as many different people from many different racial backgrounds and theological convictions, the, through the shed blood of Jesus and our faith in him, we are united with a common faith. That faith is so powerful, it can transcend any differences that we have here this morning. This is what James' plea to the Christians in Jerusalem, and it is his plea to us here today. In the new world order given by Jesus, it is our joy and duty to tackle the tough tasks and to build a community where love, peace, justice, kindness rule the day. And may God give us the grace to do so. Amen? Amen. Amen. Thank you very much.